The Elliott School team is very pleased to welcome our guest speaker, Sabrina O'Keefe. Sabrina's presentation this afternoon is entitled The SLP in the Math Class, Empowering Math Learners Through Collaboration Between Educators and Speech-Language Pathologists. The Ministry of Education has provided funding for the production of this webinar. Please note that the views expressed in this webinar are the views of the presenter and do not necessarily reflect those of the Ministry of Education nor the Learning Disabilities Association of Ontario. We will also be tweeting throughout the webinar, so if you would like to participate, you can send us a tweet by using our handle at LD at school or the hashtag LDWebinar. That takes care of housekeeping for this afternoon, so let's get started. It is now my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Sabrina O'Keefe. Sabrina is a speech language pathologist working in private practice in the Dufferin and Peel regions. She graduated from the University of Toronto and has 17 years of experience working in the field, supporting children and their families. For two years, Sabrina was on contract at Trillium Demonstration School, a specialized residential school program for students in grades seven to 11 with severe learning disabilities. At Trillium, Sabrina collaborated with teachers to integrate speech and language goals into the classroom. Welcome, Sabrina. The cyber floor is now yours. Thank you very much. Hello, and uh, thank you very much for joining me this afternoon. Uh, I had the opportunity to present this topic at the Learning Disabilities Association of Halton conference in March 2017, and I'm glad to share a freshened up version with you all today. So as Cindy mentioned, um, I do work in private practice in Dufferin Peel, and uh, my one of my jobs, one of my contract jobs was with the Trillium Demonstration School in Milton and uh, my role there was quite different than what you all may be familiar with. My mandate there was to support the language and literacy needs of the student body. So instead of splitting language versus speech, um, I was to collaborate with staff, both residents and teaching staff, to implement school-wide strategies as well as specialized intervention for students who may have had more traditional CCAC or, or LIN type goals. So I'll note to you that I do not have any school board experience. So today is going to be a conversation about how an SLP may fit into the support plan for a student with math difficulties and how inherent to training and experience an SLP may look at the presentation of math concepts in the classroom from a different perspective. I'll be providing some data along the way with respect to best practice, but we'll be sharing some of my own experiences that I've gained through my collaboration with teachers at Trillium and the support that I provide privately just to give you some food for thought. So today uh, we're going to talk a little bit about speech language pathology in general also discuss the role of vocabulary and language development and how they may impact a math learner, uh, explore the impact of executive functioning on math learning, and discuss strategies that may support students in a language-heavy math curriculum. So, uh, first, let me give you some background as to what a speech-language pathologist is and does. An SLP is a regulated health professional with at least a master's degree who works in educational, medical, vocational, therapeutic, private settings, for example. Um, we have the education and training to support all of the above areas that you see on your screen. Um, but over the years and with experience, we tend to find our own areas of interest. Although you may have a more traditional view of an SLP, so here we have a classic representation of the SLP working one-on-one -on -one with a child working on speech sounds. 
I see in this picture that there's a mirror and some flashcards and sort of based on the size of the room and the size of the window, she may be working in a small storage closet of some sort. But I would like you to consider going beyond the stereotypes and look towards a future where the SLP is, an, uh, is not an outside entity at school, but who is integral to the collaborative teaching model, supporting our kids together with functional assessments and in-class intervention. Okay. So starting off with a little bit of research on collaboration, a few years ago, I attended this conference and I listened to Dr. Archibald's presentation. And this was a review of the current literature about collaborative classroom models. And since then, I've mentored a student of hers from Western and I've started to become more knowledgeable about her passion. And Dr. Archibald really focuses on developmental language disorder. So here is some of the information that she gathered from her literature review with respect to SLP teacher collaborations. She found that it promotes generalization through classroom based services. It helps to address functional communication goals for academic activities of daily living. Uh, it supports inclusivity. It allows for the provision of differentiated instruction. Um, other benefits, the teacher can observe the SLP and successfully reinforce strategies. And the SLP can gain a better understanding of the skills that are needed for classroom success, both social and curriculum. And there's also no pullout therapy, which means there's no missed instruction time. So research indicates that when teachers and SLPs collaborate to plan and deliver oral language instruction, for example, teaching basic concepts, vocabulary and phonological awareness, students achieve greater success than when the same oral language material is taught by either participant independently. So really, we are better together. And a key word in this quote is the word plan. Collaborative teaching looks very different depending on the grade and the professionals involved, but it must be supported, supported at the level of administration. So the principal and the chief SLP. If you don't have the support to have time to plan, then it's going to be very difficult to present a successful lesson. I'm also gonna to note to you this uh, particular source, oral language at your fingertips. Uh, many of my citations come from this source and it's a great document that's been put out by the Ontario Association of Speech Language Pathologists and Audiologists. So as part of your collaborative work, I encourage you all to settle in with the OSRs and take a good look at the student's past psych ed and SLP assessment reports. And notice the following key words, poor problem solving, poor rote learning, poor recall, poor sequencing, poor organization, graphene challenges like reading numbers, challenges with orientation and directions, where do I have to be and when, there's dysregulation with routine changes, inconsistent abilities day to day due to poor long term memory, as well as weak working memory. These are all red flags for a possible learning disability in mathematics, and you need to be able to adjust your teaching strategies to maximize the student's learning. Uh, here's another great quote from a paper also out of, uh, out of Western, and it really reinforces or enforces rather the fact that those earlier assessments and findings can provide insight into future learning. So here we have in a longitudinal study of children with DLD, so developmental language disorder, um, the language abilities at seven years old predicted teacher reports of students' mathematics performance at 11. So one obvious area of expertise where an SLP can provide support in the math curriculum is in the learning of new subject-specific vocabulary. What we know is that preschoolers learn about nine new words per day. A school age child will learn up to about 20 new words per day. We also know that most learning is incidental in social interactions and naturalistic contexts. It takes place across time and environments. And for older students, 10 minutes of daily independent reading contributes to continued incidental vocabulary development. So consider those students who are not able to engage in daily independent reading because of their LD. How is their vocabulary developing? 
Learning vocabulary through hearing and reading may not be sufficient or possible for some students. Research shows that all students benefit from explicit teaching of vocabulary. We need to explicitly teach key question words that include what response is required and what operation is needed. So just recently, I, I had a really good kind of collegial Facebook conversation um, with another SLP named Janelle Albrecht, and she shared her notes from a presentation that she attended um, by Dr. Gillum. And uh, the presentation was for the York Region District School Board in April, entitled Navigating the Discourse Continuum in the Classroom, um, talking about conversation, stories, and math. Um, Dr. Gillum spoke about six structures of math problems and each structure has key or signal words that are to be taught individually. The concepts start in grade one and then they go up and the difficulty can be varied by using bigger numbers or fractions or decimals depending on what you're uh, looking at in your curriculum. So I'm going to just briefly have this here because this was sort of a late addition to my presentation but I thought it was really important to be able to share this information with you. So the six structures of math word problems uh, and the keywords that go along with them. So for example if you're looking to group or combine things the keywords would be things like all together, together and how many. Um, with change some keywords are then and now. The last four here um, equalizing, uh, an array, and, and uh, multiplicative comparing, those types of things, and then um, past those dashes are where the uh, keywords are located. Okay, so that's just something for you to have uh, in your references. So the general progression of beginning to understand a word is going from no knowledge to surface knowledge to deep knowledge. And as a person's understanding of the word deepens, its frequency of use increases. Typically, you would start to hear a student using a term after approximately the fifth exposure to a term. And note that there are five steps here on the slide. Uh, a student with oral language difficulties or an LD needs to hear a new word twice as often as their peers to understand it. They also benefit from opportunities to imitate saying the word before producing it independently. So as an example, if we were to take the word ratio, so a general sense, a, a student might say, you know, I think I've heard that word before. And then it builds to something uh, more narrow or context-bound knowledge where I think it was a word in my last math class when we were talking about apples versus oranges and a bowl, something like that. Then you start to bring in some knowledge where the student may think that, okay, well, a ratio, you use that, those two dots and they're between two numbers. And then eventually they have decontextualized understanding. So the student, um, sorry, I just had to check something. The student understands the word's meaning by providing antonyms or synonyms, uh, the role in the sentence, some common affixes, multiple meanings or metaphoric use. So for example, they may be able to say that a ratio shows a relationship or how much of one thing is compared to another. So if your bowl has four apples and five oranges, the ratio was four to five. We know that kids know a vocabulary word when they know the meaning, they know the parts of the word, they know the grammar, they know the connotations, they know the synonyms and antonyms, and they can start to use it appropriately. There are three different levels of vocabulary, and you have to think about what types of words to teach and to use in class. Tier one are your everyday words, tier two are your general academic words, and tier three would be your domain specific words. So here's another uh, visual for that. So appreciate that many of your learners are reading, writing, and speaking at tier one. And the majority of math terms fall in the tier two to tier three category range. The vocabulary may be familiar across contexts. So for example, we may use the term total 
in many subjects and contexts, but the learner has to know how it is used in the realm of mathematics. One way of building subject-specific vocabulary is to engage in the creation of student-friendly definitions. Student-friendly definitions promote comprehension and retention. Dictionary-style definitions are often difficult for students to understand and use in conversations and classroom learning opportunities. A student-friendly definition would explain the meaning in everyday language that's easy to understand. There would be the use of concrete and familiar examples. Um, you would use visuals and manipulatives. These definitions would be interesting to the student. And note they're often longer than the dictionary definition, so make sure you're allowing for time and space. Because noting that most students with oral language difficulties have small vocabularies composed primarily of high-frequency short words in comparison to peers with typical language development. So the creation of these definitions may end up being longer due to the fact that they don't have the language to be more efficient in their descriptions. Here's an example of a definition that is not student derived, but I believe it is student friendly. And I have included in the references section a link to these types of vocabulary visuals. And there's a nice one for ratio. So what does the research say? This, uh, this study by Thronberg, et cetera, it's an older study. Um, but it was heavily referenced in Dr. Archibald's research summary as having excellent reliability. Um, like I said, it is an older study, but it does provide some valuable data to the benefits of collaboration for vocabulary development. So in this particular study, there were 177 students. There were three classrooms. Uh, in each of kindergarten, so three kindergarten classes, three grade one classes, three grade two classes, and three <coughs> grade three classes. So that's 12 classrooms in total. And the, um, the study lasted for 12 weeks, or the experiment lasted for 12 weeks. There were three types of service uh, provisions. One was pull out. So weekly 50 minute small groups or individual sessions held outside the classroom by the SLP. Um, there was classroom based. Uh, service where there was a 40 weekly 40 minute SLP delivered whole class language lesson with an additional 15 minute small group pullout. And then there was a collaborative model where weekly there was a 40 minute SLP and teacher planned and team taught. And that is so key, the planning together. Planned team taught lessons with additional weekly 15 minute small group pullout. Um, the results, based on one specific measure of targeted vocabulary, is that they found a significant advantage for the collaborative co-teaching approach over either of the other two conditions for children with speech and language needs. And there were 32 kids with specific speech and language needs identified out of those 177. And for all participants, there were greater gains observed in either classroom-based condition compared to only the pull-out condition. So why did it work? Well, perhaps the collaboration fostered sharing between professionals, leading to more carryover of activities for those students with language and, and speech needs. And what were the limitations of the study? Time. It takes time to sit and plan as a team and to deliver this type of, um, type of lesson. And there was also, there wasn't any measurement regarding the generalization of this. So those were some limitations of the study. Another major area of uh, language learning that can be addressed collaboratively with teachers and SLPs is word and sentence structure. So we're talking about grammar. And just like with vocabulary learning, there should be direct instruction of word and sentence structure too. So things like the meaning of the prefix and the suffix. So to reorder something, that means you have to do something again. If something is invalid, we know that there's a negation, there's a negative there. The operation, that T-I-O-N, is going to turn a verb into a noun, so I have to know the name of something. Um, you'll be looking at con conjunctions like and and but, which is going to denote, denote two parts of your, of your question. There's um, 
there's tense. There's also looking for plural forms. There may be pronoun references. So what number has the greatest value in its column? Um, there's also time, temporal notation. He ate the cookies after he drank the milk. So what did he do first? So here's an example that has a lot of language information in it. Jody has three chocolate chip and three oatmeal cookies in her lunch, but she gave one of each to Sam and she ate one chocolate chip cookie herself at recess. What is the ratio of remaining cookies and what operation did you use to solve the problem? So in red there, we've got the and and the but, which is denoting two parts to your question. There's the word gave and ate, which is talking about the past tense. There's the pronoun she and herself. Who are we referring to? We're referring to Jody. There's that big word remaining. So what's a synonym for remaining? That would be what is left? The ratio, oh, that's a specific uh, math term and it's comparing two things. And then there's that, that uh, phrase, one of each. What does that refer to? That's each cookie. And then operation, which is denoting a noun. Um, what is the thing called that I did? It's called subtraction. And this also highlights another challenge for many kids with LD. Not only do they have to do the math, but they then have to explain it, adding another layer of language to the task. Here's another example. Um, the temperature outside in minus five Celsius on Monday, overnight it drops by three Celsius. Between 9 a.m. and noon the next day, it rises to Celsius. What's the temperature on Tuesday at noon? So it's not a huge deal and everyone makes mistakes, but there is a spelling mistake. And if you have an LD, that may be throwing you off. The term noon, that's a time convention, and that may not be understood by an LD learner to be 12 o'clock. So they may not be able to know how many hours are between nine and 12. The rote knowledge of the days of the week is also not strong. So to understand that Tuesday is following Monday is also assumed in this question. Um, a few years ago, I worked with a boy who didn't know the months of the year and he only knew them based on what hunting season he was in. So he didn't have that reference, those time references. And then there's that idea about overnight. What does that mean during the course of one night? So there's lots of embedded language uh, in these questions. Moving on now to my favorite part of the afternoon, we're going to talk about executive functioning. Um, executive functioning skills are a huge focus of an SLP's practice, especially in the areas of, of LD, of ASD, autism spectrum disorder, and traumatic or acquired brain injury. Even for a, you know, quote unquote, easy articulation kid that we're working with, we have to constantly be thinking about how we need to deliver the therapy in order to make the most gains. What type of day? Uh, am I working at the table or on the floor? Does the child need body breaks? Do I have to do cooperative or competitive games? Um, does this child need a token system? How many trials do I need to do? What types of cues? am I going to use a tactile cue, a visual cue, verbal cue, and how do I fade those cues? You know, do I use a visual schedule or do I just go with the flow with this particular learner? So it's defined as uh, the name, executive functioning is the name given to the group of processes that allow us to respond flexibly to our environment and engage in deliberate goal-directed thought and action. Executive function forms the basis of abilities such as problem solving and flexible thinking and is most likely to be used in the absence of external guidance or when a situation is novel. So really, in executive functioning, this is you being able to manage yourself. Now, this may not be an exhaustive list, um, but these are the areas that I would be considering when I work with a client. These first three, I have a few slides, these first three are identified as the critical skills for the development of mathematical proficiency. Shifting, working memory, and impulsivity and inhibition. 
So the idea about suppressing, distracting information, information and unwanted responses, only paying attention to the key ideas in your, in your math. Some more skills would be perspective taking, task breakdown, processing speed, problem solving and judgment, initiation, time management, visual memory, self-monitoring, self-regulation, uh, verbal reasoning, orientation, organization, visual processing, verbal memory and new learning, as well as attention and concentration. So now we get to a little bit of an interactive uh, part of the afternoon. Of the executive functioning skills mentioned, which one do you think is the core deficit for language learning disorders? The answer is working memory. So this is the idea of how many balls you can have in the air at the same time. Next question. What process underlies working memory? Okay. So hopefully you all selected attention. So attention is the process that underlies working memory. And so the big question now is what do you think the prevalence is of ADHD in the population of learners with learning disabilities? One last question. What do you think the prevalence is of ADHD in a population of learners with learning disabilities? More than half of all children with ADHD have comorbid learning disabilities. And 60 to 80% of children with ADHD will also have comorbid mental health conditions such as anxiety, depression, oppositional defiance disorder, conduct disorder, or a sensory integration disorder. So students with a specific learning disorder with impairments, and that's how you would, you would see it on in the DSM, students with specific learning disabilities with impairments in mathematics may dive into problems too quickly. Um, they don't understand and have a good understanding of the instructions. Oh, sorry, they don't read and have a good understanding of the instructions. They may assume that they are to do one operation because that's what they did yesterday. And they're rushing will lead to errors. They're often inflexible. They have a hard time learning new math rules as there are challenges with impulse control, working memory, and flexible thinking. They may also fixate on what they know so they can't step back and see that they need to use a new strategy. So personally, I can't do short division. So to this day, I'm stuck doing long division. I also couldn't shorten anything up in calculus class when I was doing the steps. I had to do all the steps. I couldn't shorten it up. So there's areas of our executive functioning um, that we all have challenges with. And that those are just examples of my inflexibility. These students also tend to give automatic responses. So the literature describes this as getting stuck giving an automatic response, which leads the student to ignore crucial information that suggests a change in the approach. So they have difficulty shifting from one type of problem to another. Think about the EQAO that addresses a variety of math concepts within one test or an exam that demands that you shift between many types of questions within a certain amount of time. These learners also, they tend to mismanage multiple step problems. So this is a huge stress on working memory to work on a multi-step problem. Not only do the learners have to remember the formula and the steps to achieve the answer, they also often have to use a scrap paper to show their work, but it is often so disorganized on this piece of paper that the chances of moving along correctly are very slim, not to mention visual and motor shifting from that scrap sheet now to the answer sheet. So it's a, just a lot of management. They also don't catch their mistakes with they have poor self-monitoring, poor self-regulation, and the idea of editing is just such a challenge. A student with an LD will tend to use less self-talk, but definitely benefits from teacher modeling of self-talk. So when you are writing 
a math problem. I'd like to give you some, uh, some tips to think about at the beginning stages, in the middle, and then as, at the end. So when you are writing a math problem, understand that the brain really likes white space. So provide room to show the work in the same area as the question. You may also want to consider having a word bank of tier one and two words to support the subject specific tier three words. You also may want to separate the different kinds of questions with a line or a change in font or boldness to alert the student to a need for flexibility. So this is as you are preparing to write this problem. And when the student is then presented with the math problem, it's important to underline some signal words in the directions, uh, teach them to use self-talk by providing those consistent models. You know, is this the same as the last problem or is it different? And then that can help them with the shift. They may follow a personalized checklist. First, I find the operation, then I find the conjunction to break down the question. Um, it's also important to have a calculator available and to have manipulatives available, as the students may not have made that transition from manipulatives to drawing to more abstract processing. So I'd like to talk a little bit about mnemonics as a tool. And don't get me wrong, I love a mnemonic, but this particular one, this fast draw mnemonic, is eight steps. And it's a strategy that relies on phonemic awareness for students who may have impairments with phonemic awareness. And it also has a heavy load on language, literacy, and memory. And there's embedded knowledge that describes what to do at each step. So each step is really a multi-step. And if this is going to be successful, it has to be practiced a lot. Once the student has answered the question, you would then be teaching them to edit by reversing the operation and teach them to check their answer using a calculator. So now what we're going to do is look at a real life example that came under a Google search that I did that may have been similar to um, Ontario Middle School math test examples. So when you see these, the lines may be a little bit squishy, but it's going to be less important that you can see what the words mean and more important to appreciate the overall aesthetic of the test from the perspective of a student with LD and through my lens as an SLP. So, on this particular grade eight review test, it's gonna be three slides long. The first thing that catches my eye is the disclaimer, do not write on this paper. And there's where I circled at the top, the number one. So I, as the student, have to use a separate sheet of paper to attempt to organize my answer, only to then have to put in a corresponding letter on yet another sheet of paper here at the top um, to be able to put my answer in. And this sheet of paper implies that I understand that I have to shift my answers to the questions on page one from my scrap sheet, which I may or may not have even advocated for because I have such poor self-awareness and I dive into things too quickly. I have to then transfer it to these little lines and that and uh, to this little line and represent my answer as its letter referent. So my working memory is completely taxed and subsequently my attention is waning. I have visual spatial challenges. I also have to write a letter and if I struggle with letter reversals or dysgraphia, I'm going to have an even harder time. So in this particular test too, I also worry about the lack of white space. It's hard to know where the questions change. So now I need a fourth sheet of paper so I have three pages of the test. I have one page with my scrap. Um, I have to have a, a fourth sheet of paper to cover or inhibit my attention to the other questions on the page. And there on the left where I've circled number three, I notice some tier two and tier three words like evaluate. 
So I really hope that I've had lots of practice and explicit teaching of these terms as a student writing this test. And that's just page two, showing the same types of things. And page three. So this page is both an answer page and it's a working page, which might get confusing. But I do like that each question is contained in its own box with lots of space to work. Um, I hope you've enjoyed the last 45 minutes and have gained a perspective on how teachers and SLPs can work collaboratively in the math classroom. Um, I would be remiss to not mention uh, this particular document, the Ontario government's October 2018 document entitled Focusing on the Fundamentals of Math, Grades 1 through 8, and I've attached the link for your reference there. So are there any questions or comments? Thank you so much, Sabrina. You have truly a wealth of information on the interconnectedness among language development, executive functioning, and math learners with LDs. I'm sure that the educators participating in the webinar today will also appreciate your many suggestions and strategies to support students in language-heavy math curricula. Okay, so let's move on to the question and answer segment of today's webinar. If anyone has questions, please type your question into the chat box on your GoToWebinar dashboard, and I will read your question to Sabrina. And we have questions already coming in. First one for you, Sabrina. Did you use the collaboration model at Trillium uh, for co-teaching in the classroom? Did I use uh, the, the collaboration? Sorry, I cut out. Model. Yeah, no, that's okay. Did you use the collaboration model for co-teaching in the classroom when you were at Trillium? Uh, as much as I could. Um, so understand that the student population, there were only 40 kids in the school. Um, and some teachers, uh, it, it worked better than, than with other teachers. Um, I did very much try to, to plan and to use the collaborative model with them. Um, one thing we, we found, uh, which was, I mean, which was challenging is that, you know, when you spent the extra time to plan and to really teach these concepts, there was a real challenge in being able to get through all the requirements of the curriculum. Um, so that was one issue that really, that we found um, stood in the way of having a really awesome collaboration is that um, we took the extra time to be able to um, really explicitly teach these concepts, um, but they, it was challenging to work within uh, you know, the, the time that you had to both plan it and deliver it um, and to ensure that the children are getting through the curriculum as well as learning, uh, learning what they need to use. So as much as I could, for sure, um, I was on contract there once a week. So uh, whenever I could, um, it was when we, have to, we definitely did do planning and, and uh, a co-teaching model. Great, thank you. Uh, in your experience, do students with learning disabilities who experience difficulty with the language demands in math also experience difficulty with the language demands in other subject areas? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, it's it's across the board. And uh, um, as kids get older the and, and the expectations of of language in the classroom, like thinking about science, for example, too, um, you know, you're shifting from learning to read to that reading to learn. Um, and so if you still have students who are struggling with their early, uh, early language acquisition and decoding skills um, that are inherent with a learning disability, you're going to also have difficulties in those other subjects um, and not just math, for sure, especially with the tier two and three language uh, that's that's required of those of those um, more specific subjects. Thank you, Sabrina. Mm -hmm. Next question: What strategies could be used to support executive functioning? Oh, tons. Um, <laughs> uh, a lot of things are. Um, 
you have to really look at what the individual needs. One person may require one type of intervention and another child may require a different type of intervention. This is where going back to, um, to the OSR that, would, that may include occupational therapy reports. Um, perhaps there's been a behavioral therapist involved who, who have looked at um, really supporting regulation um, and, uh, and regulation and inhibition. So looking back at what other professionals have brought to the table, um, again, that idea about collaboration, about what kids need. There are your generic, you know, where to sit and how to speak to a child and, and all that, but it's not a one size fits all. And in a classroom with so many bodies and so much going on, um, you don't know exactly what is going to affect a learner. Um, so I think it really is a little bit more of an individual approach. Um, to making sure you're you're meeting that particular learner's needs. Thank you, Sabrina. And thinking of collaboration and individualization, the next question is, do you have a collaborative planning form that would list supports and strategies for individual students? Um, I wouldn't, but I would hope that the IEP might have some information, might have some expanded information on how um, how you could go about collaborating to meet the child's needs. So um, taking advantage of, of having a strong IEP and having a really strong team um, that meets to be able to, to meet those needs, especially if you have a student coming in with a history of, of academics. Like if we have a middle school student, there's bound to be um, a trail of, of hard work that people have done to be working with this student to find out what works best and what might be less successful. Okay. Um, another question uh, that has come up, the role of the speech language pathologist seems to have changed over the years and you've talked about collaboration in the regular mm -hmm. classroom and in the special education classroom. Is there still a place in today's educational system for what used to be considered traditional speech language therapy? Well, <laughs> I mean, there is there is definitely a place. I mean, tradi traditionally, um, and, and it is changing, and I think it's going to be changing for the better. And, and uh, someone decided years ago that speech and language were two independent ideas and they're not speech sounds articulation fluency motor speech those are so heavily connected with language that to separate a child um, to work on speech only or language only is a real disservice and it really makes a difference to be able to put those two things together so um, that being said if there are uh, individual like specific goals that require a little bit of one-on-one -on -one attention and and uh, and support that way then yes the traditional um, SLP doing the one-on-one -on -one, doing the pullout um, to be able to really focus in on a few of those skills I think is really important especially when we're looking at the idea that these learners um, with an LD or, or a DLD um, do require some more care and time and explicit instruction. And so um, by having that opportunity to do some one-on-one -on -one or small group in that capacity, then yeah, um, the role of the SLP traditionally in that way is still really important. But I think what we're trying to, to show as a profession is that, you know, we are more integral in the whole, uh, in, the, in the global learning of the child, that being in the classroom to support um, classroom language um, and and it, it really is a really great use frank of of our skill set to be able to support the children within their environment and then you can really see what challenges may be impacting their learning what executive functioning challenges within that environment may be impacting their learning that we could really support so the answer is yes there's a role and yes we want another one <laughs> <laughs> And this is just me adding a personal comment here uh, with with my uh, background as well. I think the partnership and the collaboration is absolutely key. And when you talk about the the different 
tiers uh, of, of support. There were so many tier one interventions and strategies that truly are good for all students, not just mm -hmm. the learners who may have specific difficulties. Absolutely. And I did, I did find too that when I was um, working at Trillium, um, a lot of the materials that I pulled out for working with these middle school and high school students were programs that were typically done with younger children because these students were needing this type of intervention. Now, it was not preschool, the appearance was not preschool, but the content of what I was doing was for much younger learners. And unfortunately, when you have middle school students with LD, um, a lot of the middle school teachers or even high school teachers don't have that primary um, teaching background. Uh, and a lot of these students really need those primary um, primary concepts to be to be um, to be reinforced. Yes, the primary concepts to be reinforced, but at grade level appropriate Absolutely. concepts. Yeah. Absolutely. And so I think when you have something that complex, you really do need multiple people involved to make sure that you're presenting something that is age appropriate, um, that works within the curriculum, but it ties in from uh, from across the curriculum. OK, thank you so much, Sabrina. You're welcome. That's actually all of the time that we have for today. And of course, I need to pull back up my next screen here. If anyone has additional questions, further questions that were not answered or questions that come to you after we have finished the formal part of the webinar today, please either email us at info at ldatschool.ca or use our hashtag on Twitter, LDWebinar, and we will ensure that your questions get answered. Please mark your calendars for the next LD at School webinar on Wednesday, July 10. Dr. Subal will be presenting at the heart of the matter, creating classrooms and schools that support well-being. After today's webinar, you will receive an electronic link to register for this upcoming webinar. Please also mark your calendar and save the date to join us at LD at School's sixth annual Educators Institute, which will be held on August 20th and 21st in Mississauga. Public registration is now open and information on the program, registration and hotel accommodation is available on the LD at School website. And on behalf of the LD at School team, I would once again like to thank Sabrina for her presentation and thank you to all of our participants for joining us this afternoon. Please remember that we will be sending out presentation slides and a short survey following today's webinar. The feedback we receive through this survey provides us with important information for producing future webinars. And as a reminder, we will be sending out a link to this recorded webinar in approximately three weeks. Thank you again for participating. <music>